Let me thank the Nest Summit and the JV Center and FinTech TV for this opportunity to speak on this panel for climate resilience. My name is Olivier Wenden and I serve as the CEO of the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation. Our mission is to protect the environment and promote sustainable development at a local and global scale. The foundation focuses its efforts on three principal domains of action, climate change, biodiversity, and water resources. It funds projects in three main areas in the world, the MED, the polar regions, and the least developed countries. In nearly 15 years, the foundation has contributed to more than 500 projects globally. We recognize that the challenges of security, sustainable development and climate change cannot be solved by one government, one industry, or even one continent alone. That is why I am pleased to announce that the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation has formed a strategic partnership with the Stimson Center, one of the most respected think tanks in the world, and its initiative, the Alliance for a Climate Resilient Earth, which is providing global leadership for the climate resilience movement. We see the devastation that climate-related disasters are causing all over the world. Lost lives and livelihoods, damaged homes and poverty, ruined infrastructure and degraded ecosystems are endangering the very fabric of our societies. The existence of small islands and the viability of coastal cities. Rising sea levels, saltwater intrusion, unprecedented hurricanes and typhoons, floods, mudslides, droughts, epic wildfires and extreme weather events have demanded the attention of leaders in the developed and developing world alike. While no city or country is immune from these disasters, vulnerable communities will suffer the most. Marginal communities are often the most dependent on natural resources for their survival and sustenance. That is why nature-based solutions are such a vital part of any climate resilience strategy. No leader can afford to ignore these escalating risks. Climate resilience is now on par with climate mitigation and both should stand at the top of the world's agenda, reinforcing each other. The development and implementation of a climate resilience strategy is an essential precondition for the success of each of the UN Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. We need to get ahead of the destructive wave of disasters that rising climate emissions are causing. We need to instill a culture of preparedness to allow societies to progress. Most importantly, we need to act now before disasters strike. Infrastructure can become the central driver of the global movement for climate resilience if we approach it holistically. Ecosystems are where we get our fresh water, our food supply, and our building materials for shelter. Even the oxygen we breathe comes from the biodiversity of the seas and forests. Partnerships for a systems approach would enable us to not only build sustainable climate resilient homes, offices and infrastructure, but also protect the natural infrastructure that forms the living foundation of our civilization. Thank you again for this opportunity. And I will turn to my friend, Brian Finlay, the president of the Stimson Center, to continue our panel discussion. Hi, I'm Vince Molinari, and welcome to the Nest Summit, part of Climate Week New York City. Well, special thank you, Olivier Wenden, CEO of Prince Albert II uh, of Monaco's foundation, for those wonderful opening remarks. And a special thanks to you and to Prince Albert II for bringing visibility awareness to what's going on with climate and particular emphasis to me, really touching to talk about climate injustice and what's going on in the world today. So again, thank you. Uh, we have a very special panel here today. We're gonna to talk about climate resilience. I have two spectacular guests, Brian Finley, President and CEO of the Stimson Center, and Jerry Buckwalter, Chief Operating Officer and Strategy Officer of American Society of Civil Engineers. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to be here. Thank you, Vince. Well, delighted to have you both. And uh, Brian, if I can jump to you first. The Stimson Center, kind of a hallmark in, in doing so much. Could you tell us a bit about the center and uh, really about uh, the historic activities? Yeah, of course. I'm happy to, Vince. First, thanks for the opportunity. I'm so grateful uh, to, uh, to get the chance to do this with you and, uh, and, and with Jerry as well. And I also, if I may, 
just uh, say a word of thanks to, um, to Olivier and to the wider staff at the foundation as well. We're really proud of the new partnership that we have with the foundation here at uh, Stimson. And I think together through uh, a project that you're gonna learn a little bit more about here today, the Alliance for a Climate Resilient Earth that is housed at Stimson, but uh, boasts a hundred uh, or more uh, members um, where I think together with the foundation really gonna operationalize a suite of globally significant prog uh, programs and projects uh, in, in, in the coming years. And none more important than the one that you're gonna hear uh, and discuss with Jerry uh, today. Uh, it's obviously a meaningful initiative for Simpson, but it's one of many initiatives at Simpson. So Simpson, uh, just to cut to the chase and answer your question, Vince has been around for 30 years. It's an organization, we call ourselves a think tank, but uh, it's a bit of an oddball think tank in truth in that we do more than just study and research ideas. We like to get our hands dirty and actually implement projects uh, on the ground. And, and again, Jerry's going to talk a little bit more eloquently than I can about some of the work that we are, uh, that we are doing together. The organization works really generally in the international security domain, but uh, as you are aware, and we are unfortunately seeing play out uh, before our own eyes, even in our own country, on the West Coast, on the East Coast, on the Gulf Coast, in the middle of the country, you know, the impact of climate is, uh, is so significant, so severe, that it is clear to us that it is not just a, uh, a climate priority, it is a, a national security, an international security priority. And really that's our bailiwick to try to bring together diverse constituencies uh, around international security issues to try to roll up our sleeves and, and, and make a meaningful uh, impact uh, on, uh, on the world. Well, you know, Brian, that was terrific because you really connected the dots and that was that was going to be my question. And maybe if you could dive into that a little bit more, you know, think tank, oddball think tank, all of the above, but really focus around security issues and that connectivity to climate, right, is just didn't seem to be consistent, right, uh, in first blush of what Stimson would be doing. So you really look at uh, climate resilience, part of national security at this point. Is, is that fair to characterize it that way? Yeah, I think that's exactly right, uh, Vincent. And it's a great question. And it's a, and it's a question that, you, as you might imagine, we get uh, relatively often, particularly from those who have spent their careers working on on climate issues. You know, whatever a bunch of knuckle dragging uh, national security experts have to do with this uh, with this play. And it's, I mean, look, it's clear to us that the threats to our security no longer just come from armed combatants, right? This is no longer uh, the the we're not in the midst of the Second World War here. So whether it's cyber attacks on our economy, whether it's the deliberate use of of, of disease as a weapon of war. There's so many ways that one can do harm to one's adversary, uh, you know, willingly or, or, or even simply by accident. And to us, climate is something that clearly touches us all, right? We interact with the climate <laughs> literally every day of our lives. Uh, and so what we're seeing, I think, increasingly with, uh, with climate change and adaptations to our, to our climate is that um, whether it is uh, competition for resources in Asia that foments armed conflict, whether it's sea level rise or uh, or forest fires in the Americas that creates uh, climate refugees, uh, whether it's the destruction of infrastructure and uh, again in our own country that foments civil violence and competition, it's clear to us that a change in climate will really have knock-on impacts to national security. And so that's really why we have created the Alliance for a Climate Resilient Earth so that the national security can step up and play its part, but really it's a supportive role to organizations like the American Society for Civil Engineers and other organizations, governments, public and private actors who are trying to bring really a whole of society approach to what is an existential issue for, for all of us. Well, when you talk about risk at that level, you know, why is resilience so important to climate change itself? It sounds, you know, Difficult question on, on the surface, um, but you know, what, what do you make of that? And, and where, where do you put that in the standing? Yeah, no, it's a fundamental question. I mean, look, we've always been focused, I think, as a community on mitigation, right? And mitigation will always be important. It always has been important and it, and it will continue to be essential uh, to combat uh, a, ch a change in climate. Unfortunately, uh, the evidence indicates that emissions are rising and will continue to do so. And this is no longer the, the purview of just scientific prediction. We're seeing it, unfortunately, right? As I say, it's playing out, uh, unfortunately, before our own eyes, floods, hurricanes, fires. We can see, I think, for the first time here in the United States, what others have been experiencing for, for many years, the, you know, the, the practical and pragmatic impact of a, 
of a changing climate on our lives. And unfortunately, I think we're losing ground on, on mitigation. And so uh, it's not to say that we should dismiss mitigation, that we should turn our backs on mitigation and move towards resilience. But what is clear to me, at least, and, and, and Jerry can speak much more eloquently, I think, on this, is that you know, mitigation really needs to be on a par. Our resilience needs to be on a par with, with mitigation. We need both. It's, it's two sides, really, of the, uh, of the same coin. And, and we really have to do everything we can, obviously, to, to, to mitigate and reduce emissions. But at the same time, we also have to face reality. And the reality of a changing climate is that we need to be prepared for uh, what is, uh, we are experiencing today and what is going to be magnified, I think, in, in, in the future. I really like the way you put that, Brian. You know, it, it is that interplay of resilience and mitigation. Uh, and, and as we think about mm -hmm. that going forward. Um, well, look, there, there's a lot of uh, activity going on. Acre is, is standing head and shoulders uh, above so many things, I think, that are going on. Why, why is Acre different to some similar work that's going on? Yeah, it's an important question. So look, I think that what we realized as we entered this space, uh, the resilient space, is that you know, we're not the first ones to talk about this, right? There have been those, Jerry uh, and, the, and the association and others have been talking about this for, for decades uh, and the need for uh, greater attention to, um, uh, to building resilience in the, into the built environment. Uh, the challenge that we see, I think, and, and, and really the rationale for the Alliance for a Climate Resilient Earth, ACRE, is to uh, try to create some synergies between constituencies that really to date have not found interest in one another. So whether it's the insurance industry, whether it's a group of, of engineers, whether it's uh, local state and national officials, whether it's an NGO committed to building out the mangrove, whether it's, you know, we all share some piece of, of a resilience agenda. And the purpose of ACRE really is to bring that cohort together so we can learn from one another and we can better leverage the resources that we each, uh, that we each bring to the table. So our, our motto really is no, no stovepipes, right? How do we find common cause in uh, promoting atypical partnerships to create really practical and pragmatic solutions? And again, the one that I'm, I'm, I'm most proud of right now is our, is our relationship with, um, with the folks at the ASC. I've learned a lot from them. Uh, hopefully uh, uh, they've learned something from us or we brought something to the table. Maybe Jerry is he's, he's not, he's not nodding his head over there. I see, uh, <laughs> ben, so, but we'll hear, we'll hear more from him. Uh, but for us, it's, it's really uh, that sort of atypical partnership between you know, a, a, a national security think tank and the association for, I mean, who would have ever put us in the room? And yet the meaningful work I think that is coming out is going to pay dividends for generations. Well, I, I, I'm going to jump to Jerry here for a few moments, but really that's what struck me so much about Acre was really not only the levels of collaboration, but it was the collaboration between folks that you didn't anticipate, right? And finding yeah. perhaps that correlation when you didn't think previously correlated. And on top of that is, is really the levels of moving things to action, right? So not just thinking about it, no pun intended from a think tank, but becoming part of an action tank, right? Uh, so Kudos to, to everyone on, on uh, that forefront. Jerry, please, I, I wanted to bring you forward here. And uh, certainly Brian has, has teed this up and framed it beautifully for us. Uh, you know, maybe you could even start uh, fundamentally for us. Uh, tell us about the uh, ASCE. Uh, many of our viewers aren't quite familiar with the acronym, uh, certainly American Society of Civil Engineers. And yep, pretty robust organization, I think, uh, if I'm correct, 150. 50 odd thousand members perhaps? Oh, well, we'll go, we'll go bigger than that. But, but, but first I must make a correction. No one should describe Brian or Stimson as knuckle dragging national security <laughs> experts. But we, we left that to Brian himself. Oh, I know. So I had to clear that up right away. <laughs> um, well done. Uh, the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers uh, is quite, uh, aged in the sense and mature. It started back in the mid 1800s. It's one of the largest engineering uh, societies in the world. Uh, we have 150,000 members and our members are in 177 countries of the world. So while we are the American Society of Civil Engineers, we have indeed a very global footprint. Wow, um, the epitome so, of one. Yeah, so it's, uh, and, and, it, 
we play the traditional role that you would expect. So my, my comments today will be from an engineering, civil engineering perspective in particular. But I think we're, the conversation today describes how engineers who touch infrastructure, in this case, climate resilient infrastructure, I think we're entering a new era. Engineers have always built, designed, maintained everything that you live in, you transport in, how you communicate. I mean, we touch all of infrastructure. But I think engineers in the past have been a highly trusted organization and as a profession because they've specialized in doing infrastructure right, doing infrastructure projects correctly so and that it's safely. safe. It's for the public health and welfare. You know, this is a case where you lose the public trust if the bridge falls down. You know, this that is at the core of who we are. But we're entering a new era when engineers desire to be, to have a seat at the table with infrastructure owner and operators, infrastructure financiers, infrastructure insurers, so that we do the right project. We don't just do the project right. This is about creating climate resilient again, infrastructure. Gary, I don't want that to, to be lost on nuance, right? Not the right way, but the right projects. Give it one more time. I absolutely love that. Yeah. In addition to doing the project right, it's time for us to do the right project. So well and, said. And if that means we stop building on flood prone coastal areas, that's something everybody at the table should consider. If it means that we build with new materials, if it means that we build for a different use case, engineers, after all, we're the ones who are going to design and build it. That's for why can't we in this era of striving to do climate resilient activity, you have to get engineers to begin the conversation with the owner operators, with the governmental leaders who are making these choices at the start of the process. That in essence is the key change we wanna see. Now engineers also, to mirror what Brian said, action is the heart and soul of what engineers do. Engineers are essentially problem solvers. That's give an engineer a problem, he's in his glory. That's what engineers do. So as problem solvers, we shouldn't fix things after the fact. It's time to put the problem solving engineer as party to the kinds of network of coalition and coalition of people that Brian is putting together because that's how we'll start doing the right thing instead of scratching our head afterward. You know, I, I compare this to, uh, I do a lot of future planning. And when you do that, you become a bit of a historian too. And one thing I figured out with infrastructure is global society is really good at making the slums of tomorrow. Hmm. You fix that when you plan what you're going to build at the very outset not by fixing it afterward. Again, Jerry, I have to go back to this. You, you, you are so profound and full of wisdom here. <laughs> I, I love the problem solving, but we, we don't want to solve the symptom of the problem, right? You, you, exactly. It's clear that you want to be in front and be proactive and systematically solve for the change. That's, that's right. And by the way, it's only natural infrastructure in all its facets and what it produces in societal benefit, quality of life is a complex issue. Who are we to think that government leaders or engineers or financiers or insurers or building owners can fix this in their own siloed domain? That just is never going to happen. It's a complex issue. It needs the voice of all the rational people at the table 
to solve the problem. Goes, again, goes back to the core, right? The domain experts, the wisdom of that crowd to bring forward that best outcome and, and, right. and to help drive the policy based upon that knowledge set. Exactly. So I know ASCE is a, a, a proud member of Acre moving things forward. Uh, it sounded like Brian was a bit of a, a, a proud parent of <laughs> what, what's occurring here. Uh, so yeah, talk to me, and, and I believe it's ASCE 7. Is that, is that the best way to refer to the new standard that you're moving forward? No, that's actually a standard that's already out there. That's a structural engineering standard that has actually been promulgated around the world. People, and here's, so let, let me talk about standards for a minute, if yeah, I may. Please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that is one of several standards. It's a key one uh, that was generated a few years ago. And the beauty of uh, an engineering standard is it actually creates action at the grassroots level. Look, we all can sit here and talk. It's good. We create great advocacy for something. But guess what? When an engineer sitting anywhere in the world pulls out the standard, which tells him how a structure is to be designed and built anywhere in the world to be structurally safe. That's what ASCE 7 is about. Then you actually create change because those engineers are certified to that standard. Government can, can uh, tell the public they're adhering to what the world expects them to do and the engineer can safely do it. What we're working on is now a soon to be released global standard that's designed specifically on sustainable and resilient infrastructure. So we will do the same thing that we did in ASCE 7 in our sustainable and resilient standard, which will talk expressly to all the facets of what does it mean to design and build climate resilient infrastructure. And again, it's a very rigorous process because again, we're certifying engineers who, you know, go to court if something doesn't work. Uh, you know, this, this is something they can bank on. It goes way beyond the things that Brian and I can do, which is chatter about it. So uh, when you move past the chatter and you've, cut, you've elevated, if you would, no pun intended, uh, the, <laughs> the standard uh, around sustainability, what is it? Get a little granular for me. What is it? What are we actually talking about? Are we talking about more wind resistant, flood resistant? What, what, what does that all mean in the practical reality as we set this, I guess, yeah. best practice, new, new level of standard around sustainability and infrastructure? Right. So I'm going to pull up a cheat sheet here. Uh, the, 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 the standard will expressly cover life cycle cost. Resource allocation, are you building efficiently with the resources and materials that you're using? It actually looks at quality of life of the users of the infrastructure. People don't think like that about what engineers do. This is starting with the outcomes, a very important distinction. It's looking at the outcomes that the people who use the infrastructure need from that infrastructure before you start designing and building it. It will cover resilience, how well it can degrade, recover, rapidly reconstitute. It'll look at the natural resource use and it'll look at air and climate issues that it produces. So it, it's designed to cover all the facets of what we typically think of like carbon release, but it will go further and it will look at how do the people who live or transport or, or communicate through that infrastructure actually use it? And are we enabling a society that becomes climate conservative? It, again, a much bolder thing for engineers to do than you normally think of for engineers. One additional feature of, of this standard and the way we approach it. I talked about how, you know, it's all about looking at the outcomes first before you just start designing and building. But there's two other features to how you look at the outcomes that are, are changing in our world. One, you should look at it on a performance-based approach. Uh, it, 
it's time for us to get past to owner and operators just saying, here's the spec, build the building, and let's look at the performance. What do we want from that building? What do we want from that bridge? How's it gonna be used in 50 years? What's the performance we expect for the users, the citizens of the world? That's a key change. And the second key change is we have to get a lot better at life cycle assessment. Infrastructure is typically a long life cycle asset. And we have to get better at assessing the total cost of it over the life cycle and the way it's to be used over the life cycle which in this era can dramatically change in 20 or 30 or 50 years. So life cycle and performance-based thinking is also a key element to thinking about the outcomes of what we expect from our standard. So Jerry, when you look at the new standard and you talk about life cycle, are we talking about an elongated life cycle, shorter cost differentials? Is it, is it a difference when we think about maintaining that infrastructure as part of that life cycle? Well, that's where it gets really complex because uh, I'll give you a couple examples. In transportation, we might see surface transportation assets that once we go to autonomous cars need to be different enough that we actually should pre-design a shorter life cycle because its use is dramatically different. And so why would we invest in a 100-year asset when in fact its useful life has shortened to 25? On the flip side, there's no reason why some highly vertical buildings, for instance, couldn't be reformed for new use with new materials such that the basic structure should last 200 years. It's a complex question. And with the coming nexus of technology changes, communication changes, new materials, climate change, uh, demographic changes, what we expect from our world and urbanization patterns, that's a complex mix that actually means you look at a wide variety of life cycles. If we oversimplify it, we will do ourselves harm. We will look at multiple life cycles, but the biggest problem is traditionally national governments in particular around the world do not allocate the cost of a full life cycle of assets. And that's why countries end up with crumbling infrastructure because that's never pre-planned in. We are dealing with that in the U.S. in spades right now. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as you said, very complex and I don't want to dive further into that, but you bring out the point of globalization and every one of these categories uh, from demographic change to life cycle to where they are in, in an evolution is dramatically different. So to bake that into a standard, I imagine must be uh, enormously difficult. Exactly. And that's exactly right, because we do intend for this standard to be a global standard. Um, and we have engineers around the world who will use it, who are members. And, and, and that's why you base it upon resilience for the outcomes in that region. Something you do in the, let's call it the euphemistically, the global south will be very different than what you do in a coastal Northeast US city. And the standard has to be able to accommodate that. So the standard's gonna advance sustainability, resilience. Talk to me a little bit about when we look at the financials, right? What, what does this mean to the triple bottom line? I think it has a tremendous impact, but let's face it. Right now, when I talk to the finance community, when you talk about the coming digital infrastructure and coming wave of problematic risk based upon climate change, there's not a good financial model. So this is essential so that if you use the standard for designing and building it, and you use some engineering guidelines for assessing what I'll call pre-event risk, which is, has not been done well, we're going to embark on that project too, jointly with a finance company, an insurer, and a construction company to look at defining what pre-event vulnerability from climate looks like. So you combine both of those, you've essentially given an owner operator and the financier of that project a way to de-risk the development of it. That is essential right now. We de-risk it by traditional heritage standards. This is intended to do it looking forward. Wonderful. 
So um, when's the standard coming out and how do folks find more about it or be able to track it, Jerry? So we will be using our alliance with Brian Aker to get it out, particularly to the non-engineering community. We will get it out kind of ourselves to the broad engineering community. But the, the bulk of the work is done. Uh, global subject matter experts have, are in their final reviews, and we will now enter the stage where it will go out for public review in the next month or two. And we will get it out, and once we get that public comment back in globally, we will embed those comments to make sure it meets a global rigorous standard that will take several more months and we hope to release the final product to the world by mid 2021 next year. Well, absolutely love you to have you back on the Impact Show uh, uh, next year or whenever you're ready. We'd love to learn more about it when it's live. Right. As, as, as we uh, uh, end this segment, it was really delightful to have both of you. How do folks find out more about the, uh, all the other work uh, that's just so wonderful at the Stimson Center? Yeah, but thanks for asking. So there's a website right above my head uh, that uh, folks can check out of, uh, at any time, uh, Vince, and you can learn more about Acre as well at that uh, address with the extension uh, Acre at the end slash Acre. Uh, you can learn more about what we're doing in the climate resilience space. And let, if I may, Vince, just take the opportunity as well just to say uh, one other thing. You know, for neophytes like myself uh, you know, to the engineering world, it's, it's a little bit difficult to get your head around how meaningful this could be. I mean, this, what Jerry and um, uh, is proposing here is, is truly fundamental and could be such a remarkable asset to the international community in terms of addressing climate change in the long run and being prepared for some of the dire consequences we're seeing around the world today. And as I look, you know, as we stand here in, uh, in the midst of Climate Week, Vince, and as I stare at that pin on your lapel, I'm reminded that, uh, that um, you know, we as an international community have made, uh, you know, a, a set of commitments, sustainable development goals that we intend to implement. We cannot implement that alone. Government alone is not the solution. Uh, we know that. And so by looking carefully at the standard that, uh, that Jerry is proposing and by adopting that standard globally, uh, we have the opportunity, I think, to um, backfill against what is, in my view, uh, one of the greatest weaknesses of the SDGs, and that is the financing that has to go into actually making the SDGs meaningful to, to the global population. And I think, uh, and it's part of the reason I'm so excited to be working with Jerry um, and, and a group of engineers on this, is that, uh, is that it can promise, I think it does promise, to open up incentives for investors to fundamentally rethink and, uh, and backfill against the, uh, the necessary financial resources that will be necessary to, to build a more climate resilient environment. Private sector so needed to advance and, and achieve the goals of the SDGs, no question, Brian. Well, thank you, Brian. Jerry, thank you so much. Really appreciate you both sharing all your wisdom and insights here. And congratulations on advancing such meaningful work. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Vince. Thank you. Thank you thank both. You.